class today is just going to continue on from where we left off yesterday. So we, we looked at all the admin issues yesterday, we looked at the grading, um, the projects, the assignments, the requirements that this course has. And uh, we also discussed a bit at the end what the appropriate group work looks like. So that's, that's important, uh, the, what I like to put into the appropriate group work and re requiring um, sorry, the requirements regarding academic honesty and dishonesty. That's quite, that's critical, in, in, especially in high level years. I take that extremely seriously. Uh, so, so please take that, um, not as a warning, but just as a, just something to be aware of in this course. It's not something that I, I see too often. Um, then, regarding the midterm, I've had a, a lot of response via the website on various different days. Uh, there's issues like the Canadian Society of Chemical Engineering Conference that's out in Vancouver that week of the uh, 17th, uh, sorry, the 15th to the 18th, I think, October, somewhere around that range. It, so the same day that I had the midterm is the CSCHE conference, uh, people's mechanical engineering classes, obviously that night. Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday were for some but not for others. So pretty much I'm leaning towards the Friday the, um, on the 12th of October. Um, I, it's the best I can do to fit everyone in. I don't want you to lose your class. I think mechanical engineering, you have an exam anyway that week. So um, this is probably the best middle ground. So just before CCHE, it's just after Thanksgiving. It's in between an assignment and your project outline for this course. So it comes at a period of time where it, it may work better for you. Okay, so unless there's serious disagreements, I'm going to be going to test event before the 12th of October in the evening from uh, 6.30 to 9.30. And then uh, we're going to go to that okay, So unless I get strong feedback, otherwise that's, that's going to be the, the Okay, so today's class is just an overview of, of why separation processes are important and why, why they're worth studying. We'll look at some examples. I guarantee that by the end of today, when you go home for the weekend, you're not going to look at your house or your body in quite the same way. Um, and then we'll look at a very uh, interesting process for sugar production. Sugar is something most of us consume, or all of us probably consume inadvertently in all the foods we eat. And I think this little video that I'll be using to show you the flow sheet will be quite an eye opener for you. Um, we'll look at the concept of separating agents and then how we can look at separation processes. And I'll also discuss in the course uh, a bit about the feedback that I got yesterday from the forms. So There's some interesting material there, and I'll talk a bit about that next. So, the need for separation processes is quite simple. We can't beat the second law of thermodynamics, which is Do, we will always have increasing entropy around us. So if I add salt to water, I don't mix it, I just add it, it will naturally dissolve and mix in with the water. A company pumping CO2 into the air or any pollutants into the atmosphere doesn't stay localized to that region, it spreads across the entire globe. So that's that's a form of the example of the dynamics. Pollutants pumped into a lake, Ontario, will eventually land up in the ocean and diffuse. And, and reach the entire water system and spread through it. Be so dilute, maybe that you won't be able to pick it up, but if we keep doing that, it's, it's obviously going to be damaging to the environment. And my kitchen sink at home, I'll wash the dishes and <laughs> turn my back and then there's more dirty stuff there. Like it's just, that you can never, you can never win with your house, whatever it is you try to keep clean and ordered, it never, never stays. So things always tend to tend towards increasing cleanliness and entropy. And Separation processes, by definition, are the very opposite of that. We're putting in energy or some form of work to undo what entropy is, uh, has happened, what, what's happened then into the same law for the dynamics. Um, and we do that for a variety of important reasons, and usually it's because we're adding value. Okay? That's why we're, we're, at, we're there are, uh, separating. So here's, a, here's some examples um, that I'd like you to think about for a minute. Talk with the person next to you. How would you separate salts from water? There's two very interesting methods. Uh, one group yesterday in the forms actually mentioned the electro which I wasn't aware of. 
electrodialysis is, is an interesting approach. How would you go about separating salt from water? Talk with the person next to you for a minute or two and then uh, just throw out some answers. Concentration is related to cost in a linear way if you plot it on a log scale. 
Um, and then the other reason is that separation processes use up most of our operating costs in, in, in most chemical plants. Now, the other reason for looking at separation processes, which I think is important for us going forward, is to realize that when I talk about us globally, as in the entire Earth, not just Canada or yourselves or us in this class, that most of the problems facing us are separation problems. So we have issues that will impact us in our life very, very strongly on carbon capture and storage, and methane capture and storage. It's another greenhouse gas that's increasingly damaging. Air pollutants, and then water. So those are three areas that are really critical to us going forward as a, as a population in the next few years. Um, and it will impact you. And unfortunately what happens is that the problems over there get worse and worse in proportion to the size of the population on the earth. And by your lifetime, by the time you die, you will have likely a population here on the earth of 10 billion. I may see 9 billion in my lifetime, you'll probably see 10 billion. We're right now at 7. So here we are at the end of the blue line, we're right here now, and we're right there at 7 billion. Okay, so the United Nations estimate for middle case scenario is 10 billion, probably by around the time that you pass away, if you lived a long life. Okay. Or an extremely long life. And then, if we take somewhere between the middle ground and the high ground, we're going to easily be likely over 10, 10 billion. And those problems related to carbon capture, energy use, and particularly access to clean water and separating our pollutants from it is going to impact us, for sure. So, so this is a, an important reason to be aware of separation processes and, and the role that engineers and chemical engineers play in helping solve some of these issues. Okay. So that, that sets the stage a bit for why separation costs is important from a day-to-day -day engineering economics point of view. It uses up a lot of our capital costs and a lot of our operating costs. And then there's also a global and social reason why we should be interested in it. Now I'd like you to think a bit, just a bit, how you've seen separation processes in your home. Any there's three that I've listed. So you will made pasta and use one of these guys. There's your screen. And so you've separated your solid from your liquid phase over here. Adsorption, when you wash your hands or dishes, you're using soaps and that dissolves away fats into the, into the soap. Liquid-liquid extraction, if you've mixed oil and, and vinegar or spices and then you try to extract the flavor from any leaves or spices into the oil phase and you use that as flavoring for dishes that you cook. Anything else that you can think of that you've seen around the house? Making coffee? What, what type of separation process is that? So it's a filtration and then how what, what are you separating from what? It's an interesting one. <laughs> You're trying to extract hot from the grounds, and so that's a leaching step. So we're leaching out. So if you've got an espresso machine or a coffee filter, or this monster thing here in the front is not for me to drink, but it's to demonstrate exactly that. So we've got So there you go. So what's separating from what over there? flavors from those leaves into the hot water there to encourage the separation of that desired part into the liquid phase from the solid phase. So that's a pure leaching step 
And we'll, we use that over and over in, in our house, like we mentioned for espresso, tea, um, and it's also common in many chemical processes to leach and extract out um, the desired path of interest. So in the mining industry, they'll put crushed sand and ore above the ground and they'll pour cyanide over it and leach out the gold phase into the cyanide and then recover the liquid phase with the, the gold cyanide and then separate the gold out from the cyanide afterwards. So that's a, a classic leaching step that's very, very prevalent. Anything else around the house? shells of their child. And what does it do? What's the purpose of those words? Yeah, the word It's mainly for odors, mainly for chlorinated compounds that people find objectionable when they're drinking water. And so those those liquid those compounds that are in the liquid phase are then adsorbed, A D S O R B. So adsorb and adsorb, AB. Adsorb is very different from adsorb. So these compounds in the water that are undesirable get adsorbed onto this carbon-based material into, and they go into the structure of the carbon material and then get held behind while the water filters out here through the bottom through this four holes on the mesh. So there's filtration here as well, just a simple filtration to hold your adsorbent back and then um, separation of the liquid phase from the undesirable chemical compounds. Anything else in your house? Water softener, similar principles, right? Salad spinner, yeah, so that's, which principle is that? Centrifuge, yeah. What about vacuum cleaners? Vacuum cleaners is a classic filter. Uh, but here's an interesting one that I want to show you. If you haven't seen this type of vacuum cleaner, um, this may be interesting for you. No, and perseverance. Just some of the qualities you'll need to make it as a successful entrepreneur. What Butler's enterprising approach revolutionized the world of vacuum is James Dyson. Dissatisfied with traditional vacuums, he decided to take action. But I thought there must be a better way of doing that with him, so I took the vacuum cleaner with this. And so I discovered that the problem was that the air is supposed to get through the bag, and of course, when it does dust, it goes into this new blocks and little holes and pores in the bag. And so it splits the air, and so it splits the sun. So what I wanted to do was replace the bag, since the bag is all. James looked around for a technology which could improve this and took inspiration from the cyclones in sawmills. Well, I, I rushed home and made a small model of what I'd seen on top of the sawmill and um, fitted it to a vacuum cleaner with a little hose, pushed around the well first vacuum cleaner with a little loss of suction. Now, um, and then I started to see the series of developing cyclones and use vacuum cleaners, and I thought it would be quite a quick process. In actual fact, I had to build 5,100 prototypes before I got it perfect. James patented the cyclone technology, which means that it's protected from being copied by other people or companies. Okay, so then uh, I won't go on this little video that goes on and on, but uh, the point is that he's used cyclone technology. So when I first saw that, I was a little bit pissed off because this is a technology we've been using as chemical engineers for hundreds of years, since the 1990s. If you look at any chemical process where there's any dust phase separation from, from fluid phase, there's always, almost always a cyclone involved. And here's this guy who's taken the technology that we've been using for years and just patented and used it in vacuum cleaners at home. 
and think about it, it is novel to, to take technology and scale it down to literally those units are about that big, and there's about nine to 10 cyclones in that little compact vacuum cleaner. Uh, and if you go look at them in Sears, they're $500 vacuum cleaner, but as he says there, it, it doesn't suffer from the shortcoming of traditional vacuum cleaners, which is you've got a filter that just gets caught and you have to clean it out eventually. So with this vacuum cleaner, it doesn't suffer from that loss of suction over time, which is what a filter will do. The filter will gradually get blocked and blocked and blocked, and the pressure gradient over that filter needs to be higher and higher in order to achieve the same separation. But a cyclone is great because it's a continuous unit that's continually getting rid of the accumulated material and separating out the fluid phase from the solid phase. So it's, it's fairly novel, and, and that's, I guess, just how we got these cases through this. So there's an interesting, another interesting application that's uh, from home-based use. Okay, so uh, this is uh, yeah, so we covered, uh, covered most of those that came up here during the class. So a few others that you maybe haven't mentioned are centrifugation in your washing machine, when you're washing your clothes, um, your clothes dryer, that's a, another separation step, you're separating the vapor phase, uh, you're creating a vapor phase by heat addition. Um, or in your basement, sometimes you may have a dehumidifier. So then you're creating a liquid phase by heat removal to create a separation. So you have these separation processes all around you in your home. You also have that in your body. The body is really a sequence of separation processes in terms of the daily activities. Um, there's kidneys that will separate the waste from the blood. Your kidneys also have the job of reabsorbing water um, and salts back into the bloodstream. The lungs, obviously, carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange. Liver, your gallbladder, and intestines are there to absorb nutrients. Your spleen removes all the red blood cells. And your lymph nodes, for any of those um, that know uh, any cancer patients, one of the first things they do is remove your lymph node because your, your lymph nodes are responsible for catching the cancer and isolating it and spreading it through your body. So this multiple separation processes in your in your body as well. And do think the unit operations we're going to discuss in today's class. Mass transfer and transfer. Okay, so another video that I would like to uh, take a look at here is the sugar flow sheet. So if you've got the notes printed out, um, we'll have the sugar flow sheet in front of you. And uh, what I'm going to do is just uh, play this video again in this awkward manner that I have. Yeah. 
and damage to the cane during harvesting accelerates this decay. At the mill, trucks empty their load onto a receiving table. It feeds a belt conveyor that takes the cane through two separate washes. The cane must be as clean as possible before extracting the juice. First, the cane's hard structure is broken down inside this crusher, where rotating hammers break the cane into small pieces. A conveyor loads it into a milling tandem designed to extract the sweet juice from the crushed cane. In this milling tandem, the cane passes through a series of five or more consecutive mills. Large cylinders compress the cane fiber. Juice pours out of the milling tandem and diverts into a channel away from the bagasse, the dry pulp that remains after extracting the juice. A worker supervises the operation at each of the mills. A vat collects the juice that flows from the top and bottom of the mills. Now that the juice is extracted from the sugar cane, it's time to process it. However, before turning... Sugar crystals. 
As the water in the syrup boils away, workers regularly check to see how the sugar is crystallizing. The goal? To produce a thick crystallized paste known as masquit. It then goes into a high-speed centrifugal machine to remove the sugar crystals from the uncrystallized syrup. Inside, the sugar spins at 1200 revolutions per minute. This action draws the molasses to the outer shell of the machine, while the crystals remain in the inner basket. Sprays of water wash the crystals, then the water is drawn out so that only the crystals remain. Centrifuge works much the same way as a washing machine set on a spin cycle. It draws out moisture from the sugar, much like you draw out the wash water from a load of laundry. Next, a conveyor belt carries the sugar crystals out of the centrifuge. is raw sugar, which has a high molasses color and is unbleached, and plantation white sugar, which has less molasses and is bleached a brilliant white. The sugar on the conveyor now goes into a large dryer. Hot air blows into this dryer to bring the sugar's humidity level down to 0.02%. That's standard for table sugar. sugar pours out of the dryer into a bag on a scale. It's full when it weighs in at 1,000 kilos. A hoist then carries the bags to a platform at the far end of the packing facility. At 3,000 kilos, that's a heavy load. It lowers each bag over a chute that leads to the factory's main floor. Workers carefully open each bag in turn and pour out the sugar directly into the chute. It feeds an automated packaging machine, which fills a series of two kilo plastic bags, seals them, and separates them. This packing facility produces 200,000 bags a day. That means processing 400 tons of white sugar daily. Fine plantation white sugar is available in a variety of convenient packaging options. So, uh, the whole sugar flow sheet is purely a separation from beginning to end. So, where there was a juice, actually, we started um, briefly yesterday after the winnowing. Well, that was there where they separated the, the cane sugar from the leaves out in the field that's winnowing. Um, we use that actually in the oat industry as well. So, oat husks are separated from the oat seed inside. Yeah, so that's a winner except and there's just a sequence of uh, subsequent separations, crystallization, filtration, uh, evaporation, precipitation, you saw there, centrifugation, sequence of those set up in, in an interesting way to get to that final final level. Now, if you if you have the notes there in front of you, um, if you got them printed out in time, that video mainly focused on part one of the flow sheet, which um, which was those, uh, those, those steps over there. But then, after at the end, that raw sugar, that's 97% purity. So going from the field to, the, to that end, which is 97%. Then the second flow sheet that's there that wasn't really addressed in the video at all, has some interesting filters and, um, and, and the blow-up tank over there is a precipitation step where they add more lime, they add phosphoric acid, and that takes out some of those brown colors and impurities and gets it up to about 99% or in higher purity um, and you get your lighter colored sugar coming out at the end. So a whole lot of good operations just to take it up by a further 2% uh, there at the end. So that's, that's worth uh, we're taking a look at again. Uh, the video, you can watch it in the context of the flow sheet to see those various unit operations. It, those units are not something we've seen before. Um, but I, I will just uh, point out here some other photos there. The filter step that's used up 
in the, in the beginning. So those are the, the filters. They fill with earth to help um, ab absorb some of the material. Over here, those are the char beds that are used for decolorizing. So very, very big size units. So there's, there's what the guy standing over there. So that just gives you an idea of the context. Vacuum pans up over here. And then here's the centrifuges. Yeah, so multiple centrifuges there that you saw in the, in the flow sheet. Um, so take a, take a look at that, at that video again in the context of the flow sheet. So it, will, it covers a lot of human operations we're actually going to be looking at in this class, which is um, where I'm heading to next. So based on the feedback I got yesterday, in order of interest from, from you guys, from highest to lowest, was a whole lot of membrane-based uh, materials. So reverse osmosis and membranes factored right right up at the top, and that is covered by this class. Next was distillation. I'll talk about distillation in a minute. Centrifuges, cyclone filtration, that's exactly what we're covering over the next uh, two weeks, starting Monday, we'll start looking at the filtration. Uh, juicing, was that uh, was up there? Uh, that's strongly related to bioseparations as well, where we have to rupture cells, extract material from the cells, and then we separate downstream from that. Uh, so we don't cover juicing directly, because that's just a pure mechanical rupturing step. Um, but then the subsequent steps of purifying and separating out the parts of interest, that is covered by schools. Ion exchange and crystallization and chromatography, we'll cover those. Electrophoresis, I'll talk about that as well on the slides, and zeolites. Um, and then some column-based operations we'll mention. And then there was some interest, there was one group that had some interesting uh, topics on petrofracking and hydrofracking. Uh, those are topics that I can't really fit into this course. There's just so little time, but I, there, there was a one or two people interested in that. I would like you to come speak with me. I've got an interesting article on that that I can share with you, and please consider that for your project um, for this course. Okay. So let me talk about that in it now, uh, where, where we're heading. So based on that material that I got from you and uh, what my plan was originally, we're going to start off uh, next week, Tuesday, by looking at mechanical forces being applied to create a separation. So we're going to look at gravity, sedimentation. We saw that in the video where the guy was pouring the sugar uh, uh, mixture into that cone and it was separating out by gravity into a thickened phase and the liquid phase at the top. So thickeners and clarifiers are, are applications of sedimentation and they feature prominently in wastewater treatment as well. We'll then look at saying, well, what if gravity is not enough? We can't wait just for gravity, we really need some stronger force, so we go and apply a centrifugal force, many, many times the strength of gravity to uh, separate much faster. Uh, cyclones are another form of applying a tangential force this time. So as we turn this material around through the cyclone, we're creating separating forces. So it's the same, same principle. Electrophoresis and magnetic separation, well, that was another one that came up from one of the groups. Um, those are two other based systems where we're applying an electrical force or a mechanical force then to encourage the separation. So I will um, hopefully have time to just cover those in maybe a few minutes, but it's the same principle. We're applying forces and, and using the properties of the material that we're uh, separating to encourage that separation. Then the next part of the course after, so this will take about two weeks or so, maybe two and a half, and then we'll start looking at filters, membranes, uh, hemodialysis, or just dialysis as it's often called, is a, is a direct application of membranes, uh, reverse osmosis, and then bioseparations feature quite prominently in, in this area. The reason for that is because bioseparations uh, are done at often room temperature or body temperature, they're done in aqueous medium, they're done in atmospheric pressure, and membranes and filters are natural uh, to achieving that. So we'll, we'll, we'll mention some of the bio, we'll look at that from a bioseparations application point of view. Then the next part of the course, and, and actually interesting there, and on Friday the 28th of September, I have a guest speaker coming from GE, the former Xenon, and he'll be coming to the class and talking about membranes. He's a, he's a uh, works for the company for a number of years, and he's told me that he will be able to make a membrane in class for us that day. And show, show us how it's done using some basic inputs. So that should be an interesting class at the end of the month. Um, 
here we've got mass transfer based separations next. So we'll look at this around after Thanksgiving, where we're using liquid liquid or solvent extraction, as it's sometimes called. Supercritical fluid extraction, where we're increasing the temperature and pressure really kind of highly to achieve that separation. And um, some, a group had asked for crystallization. There might be a chance just to introduce the topic of crystallization there, but it's, it is quite a lengthy topic that I may not fit it all in. We'll then look at the uh, near the end of October at adsorption, ion exchange chromatography. These are column based units often where we've got a solid phase and a fluid phase. And zeolites fit in there. Zeolites is just a form of molecular sieve or it's an adsorbent that's used in ion exchange columns. And then finally, we'll end the class off by looking at heat transfer based separations, evaporation, drying, crystallization. And distillation fits in there quite naturally. Now, I must admit, distillation featured very prominently on your list. It was the, the third most requested topic. We covered distillation in 3M, binary distillation, right? Now, the topic of distillation, to continue it on from that point of view, there's no point in recapping the binary distillation, the okay, K-field diagrams as well. But where it does go on is to multi-component distillation. And there, that topic is extremely extensive. It's usually a five, six week chunk of a course in separation processes. So for me to put distillation in, I don't mind doing it. I've got a lot of material from Jim Dixon to work on. I have many good textbooks to, to, to use there. But my feeling, my reason when I was designing this course back a few months ago was I left out distillation. For the one reason it is multi-component distillation is extremely equation based. So equations that you cannot solve by hand. Uh, they're all computer based, which is why this multi-component distillation columns are designed using tools like Aspen and ISIS. So you've seen that in 3G. Um, and to look at multi-component distillation, just to set the stage and go through that would take about three or four weeks and, and take away a bit from some of the other topics. Now I'm happy to put distillation in, but I'm going to leave that decision until we've covered mass transfer based separations. And then you can tell me around here if you'd like to rather see distillation or evaporation, drying, or crystallization. I can't do both. I can do one, either distillation, or I can do the other three. Um, so I don't want to cut out distillation. I know it seems to be some of but I'll leave that at the fluid for now um, and just put it out there so you're aware of that. OK. Um, just a few more slides before we end up for the week. Um, here, just to put bioseparations into perspective, um, there's a, the, the topic of separation processes and bioprocessing is often called downstream operations, is how they refer to it. Anything downstream from the bioreactor is, is a separation step usually in, in those portions. And the only difference is that they're done in biocompatible conditions, so uh, body temperature, regular atmospheric pressure, uh, average pH, and done in aqueous medium. Um, but we will actually cover a lot of the topics that we would normally be covered in a pure bioseparations course, such as centrifugation, chromatography, filtration, and membrane separation. So we'll see all of those. Um, and it also explains why bioseparation uh, companies, you'll see, find a lot of chemical engineers, not just bioengineers or engineers with a bio background. It's because many of these topics are just pure chem energy applied to biosystems. Um, I've covered this part here before um, in the previous slide. I just mentioned over here, when I look at this course, we'll be looking at, uh, for every one of the different operations, we'll be understanding the physical principle that's at, at play. Um, we're going to look at how to design the units based on those physical principles, how do you size it and scale it up, perhaps. Um, we'll look at how the unit's cost is, is affected, how to troubleshoot the unit, and how to and I'll focus on this one quite heavily, is how to optimize it for maybe less energy use, how you can increase the separation efficiency, what if you want to change the units in the moment of operation. Um, so those are important topics to look at. So what I'll do is I'll leave it at that um, for, for this week. What I, I'll pick up the topic of mass and, and energy separation agents next week. But what I want you to do is the following. Uh, I'll post this, this, these notes are on the website, this will be part of your first assignment, is take this grid and on the 
vertical axis, you have the major component. So if you have your major component being, for example, a liquid, and your minor component being solid, what would be the type of separation unit that you would use to separate over there? Okay, so for, for that case there, say if your major component is a liquid, your minor component is a solid, it might be something like dust that's in or set of sand that's in a liquid stream. So how would you separate a small amount of sand from a large volume of liquid? What are, what are your options? And so go through the grid and fill in the type of unit operation you would expect to be seeing in, in that coordinate um, in, in the grid. But that will be the first question.